So Dylan is a six-year-old boy. He's standing at the edge of the diving board. He's never dived into the deep end of the pool before. And he stands there, and it seemed like a really good idea back when he watched other kids do it. And all of a sudden, he's standing out there by himself on the end, and that looks like a long ways to the water, and the water looks really deep. And that fear just grabs a hold of him, and he can hardly breathe. But there's somebody in the water, and his mom is saying, it's okay, I'm right here, I'll be with you, jump. You know, he thinks about, it's not that far back off the board. And finally, he takes that plunge and jumps off. And we're talking about the promptings of God today. How when we say God speaks to us, it's not like a teleprompter jumps down from heaven and we can read the words so off, or an angel appears to us, at least hasn't to me yet. But God stirs in our hearts, he challenges us, he causes us to think in a different way than just how we would normally human, humanly think. It was exciting the last baptism we did when we had the baptism class. Um, several people came to the baptism class, some of whom had been in the church for a long time. And they said, when you were talking about baptism, my heart just started hammering. I could tell that God was calling me, that I needed to obey, and I know this is my time. And that's what we want, to provide an opportunity for the Spirit of God to not only speak through His Word as we meet together, but to whisper to you all week long. And we talked about that in some ways last week, how God challenges you and encourages you. Somebody told me last night, they said, you know, you've been bugging me ever since you asked that question, do I really care about people? And he said, I think the answer is no, I don't really care about people, and that bothers me. And sometimes the Spirit of God will take a question like that and burrow it into your heart, and, and it starts bugging you for more than just the time you're sitting here. But I also want to move that to the next step. I want you also to think about how God wants you to help prompt other people. That there's not only the God element to it, but God uses us in each other's lives. That's what this whole Sharpen series is about. And sometimes you're the person on the diving board making the, okay, God, i got to try to do this. And sometimes you're the person in the water saying, come on, I'll be with you. You'll be okay. And you're shouting encouragement and encouraging words and offering your heart and your life and you are being used by God to help prompt other people's steps. And the wonderful part is that God lets us be on both sides of this adventure all the time. That he's prompting us, we're to prompt others, other people prompt us, and God uses them in our lives. And it's an adventure of living a life with God instead of saying, I'm a Christian, I believe 20 years ago, I got baptized, I joined the church, and now I'm just waiting for heaven. Getting saved is not just a get out of hell free card. It's an invitation to a life in the Spirit, a life with the Spirit, a life with Christ. And I find that far too few Christians really understand that or embrace that. And so I want to look at the story of a guy named Philip in the book of Acts and how God used him and how God worked in him to not only use him, but to help him grow. Because God gives us opportunities to step into working with him in building his kingdom in this world. And every time you say yes, not only is God able to use you, but he develops you. So every time you say yes is a preparation for the next thing that God wants you to do. And when you say no, then you are missing a gap and you maybe not have the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the growth that you need. And so let me uh, start with Acts chapter 6. I'm going to read you a couple of verses out of the first part of this chapter. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. 
And maybe you look at that and you go, huh? What's a Hebraic Jew? What's a Hellenistic Jew? And how come they're not feeding grandma? What I want to know is what kind of church is this, right? So let me give you a little bit of backstory. Jesus had taught for three years, and he was then crucified in Jerusalem, and he was raised from the dead. And for 40 days, he focused on pouring into his disciples and showing them that he was alive and real. And then he went back to heaven. And in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes on all the assembled disciples, probably about 120 at that point, and they spoke in other languages. And the critical part of that was that there were Jewish people from all over the world. They'd come from Rome, they'd come from Bithynia, they came from all over to celebrate the Passover, which is when Jesus was crucified, and they stayed 50 days to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, which was another, the next thing on the Jewish calendar. And so they were in Jerusalem during this incredibly important time, and they heard the message about Jesus in each of their languages. Now, they probably already spoke some Aramaic, because that was kind of the language of Israel. They may have spoken Greek. A lot of them spoke Greek, since that was the language of basically the whole world at that point. But they each heard them speaking in their heart language. And so God used Peter, and he said, what must you do to be saved? You need to repent and be baptized, and let's get going. And it said there were 3,000 people that were added to the church in that one day. I don't know what you would call that. I'm all in favor of church growth, but that is a holy mess. <laughs> that is chaos to whatever degree. Because you've got all these people that don't know each other, and they've just given their life to Christ, and they have one thing in common, but they are different on many, many other levels. And so what happens is some of these people came from around the world. Well, they hadn't planned on staying there, but now this is where Jesus church was. This is where the Holy Spirit was working. So they stayed. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have their house. And they soon were having trouble eating. And so people sold their houses, sold their land, sold their, their, their possessions, and they started taking care of each other. But you know how some things aren't always even as they should be even? And when it's my grandma, since I live in Israel and I'm a Hebraic Jew, I mean, I speak Hebrew, and then there's some other old lady that I don't know, and she's from Bithynia, she may not get the first cut. And you know how people feel when grandma's not getting fed? Yeah, so all of a sudden, there's this tension that developed. And you know, people say, I wish we were in a church like the New Testament church. And I always think, like, you want fights and divisions, and uh, you want false teachers, and actually, I think we've already got all that. It wasn't this golden age where nothing went wrong. It was real people, right? Because wherever you have people, there will be... Come on, I'm not that hard to follow. Wherever you have people, there will be problems, right? And so there was this problem that developed, and they had to figure out what they were going to do. So here was their plan. The apostles, the 11, who were the leaders of this group now, said, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This was good leadership. The apostles realized they couldn't do everything. Now, making sure people get fed, involved in compassion, caring for people, that's a valuable ministry. They were just saying, that's not what God called us to. It is so important that you know what God called you to, because then you can do it with all your heart and with all your might. It is not always the same as what everybody else calls you to. Somebody said, God loves you and everybody else has a wonderful plan for your life. I don't know if you have found that to be true. But other people often think, well, you should do this, or you should do this, or you should do this. And you really need to have that leading that God says, this is what I want you to do. And if you can notice, in the case of this situation, it may not be a permanent assignment. It may be a time for right now. And so they said, here's the plan. You guys choose seven people that you trust the jury of your peers, you choose them, and we will put them into this task of making sure that people are taken care of and that things are equitable and, and that the food goes to everyone. And so it's, they said, okay, let's do that. And they chose seven people, and the, the two criterion were that they be full of the Spirit. Now, 
That sounds a little funny since everybody had just been filled with the Spirit. But what they're saying is these are people that had spiritual velocity. Spiritually, they were growing. They were being led by the Spirit. They were surrendered to God. And last week, I challenged you to say we need to go from knowing to doing. And I got some good feedback. Somebody said, it sounds like you were just saying, grab your own bootstraps and try harder. That's not how it works, is it? Because we can't save ourselves, and we can't cause ourselves to grow, and we can't even change our own bad habits. What we need to do is to surrender more deeply to the Spirit of God and let Him work in us what He's going to. And only when God begins to change you will you really change. But you have to give him permission to do that. And we have to recognize that we need it. And so he says, I want people who are living like that, with the Spirit in touch, listening, connected to God. And then he said, I want them to be full of wisdom. And usually wisdom, in my experience, comes from experience. And experience comes from mistakes. And you don't learn wisdom by doing everything right to begin with. You learn it by... Failing, acknowledging that, learning how not to fail so badly the next time. I think it also means that they were good with people. Unfortunately, people who love God do not always know how to deal with people. In, in our church, we call it emotional intelligence, EQ. And in shorthand, it means I know what's going on in driving me. I'm aware of what's going on in you. I'm sensitive to seeing when you're having a good day or not. And... I'm aware that I have an effect on the room. I, whether I'm sitting or talking or whatever, I'm influencing the room. And so if you think about what they were being handed, this group of 3,000 that didn't really know each other, they're already mad at each other because the Jews from out of town are not getting grandma fed. And there's an easy way to divide from the Jews who live in Jerusalem, in Israel, from the Jews who live elsewhere in the world. And so they were asking them, They were not just coming in to be waiters to make sure that the food was all apportioned. They were asking them to settle a big church fight. And so he said, I want you to be full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. And they said, here are seven men. So if you look down in just a little bit in chapter 6, it says, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip. And then Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon. And the interesting thing about it, which you probably can't tell, is that every one of those names is a Greek name. They didn't choose Micah and John and Peter, the Hebrew names. They chose the guys that had a sensitivity to the problem, the ones from out of town. And Philip was chosen for that. And they said yes. This was how God prompted them in this case, was there's a need in the church family. You guys choose some people. The apostles are going to delegate to them and bless them and then get to the work. Now, the funny part of this story is that we never see them actually doing this. Evidently, they did this so well that they soon didn't have a job, but they said yes to what God called them to. I believe that we need to have a resurgence of how we think about church. All of my growing up years, especially in small rural churches in America, The idea is that the ministry of leading people to Christ, discipling them, encouraging them, answering questions, really is the pastor's job. And if he has a good congregation, then the people say, Pastor, you do it, and we will help. I believe we need a a Home Depot revival, which says, you can do it, We can help. You see, I I think this is a very serious problem. I, I think that we don't intend to be involved in evangelism or in discipleship. We hope the church will do that. Well, who is the church? Yeah. And quite often when we say the church, we mean some leader people or somebody, not me. And I want to ask you a couple of convicting questions. How long has it been since you started a conversation with somebody that wasn't a believer in a way that led to a faith discussion? 
How long has it been since you shared your testimony with somebody and told them about how God changed you? How long has it been since you prayed with somebody as they committed their life to Christ? How long has it been since you were a part of baptizing somebody who's come to faith? How long has it been since you took a brand new believer under your wing and said, let's meet weekly for a while so I can help you get rolling? And I'm afraid that the answer for most of you is it's been a long time. And whether we acknowledge it or not, it's because we think those things are important, we assume somebody else is supposed to do it. And so when God prompts us, we often throw it over to Somebody else, I sure hope they take care of that. And let me tell you a sad fact. 80% of the churches in America are plateaued or declining. 80%. And there's only maybe about 15 or 16% that are growing by what we call addition, which means that a church body sees, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 people added to the, the church roles who some of them are coming from out of town, some of them are saved through the church influence, through Christ, through that church. And there's a very small percentage that are growing by what we call multiplication. And we have been an addition church for quite a while. Sometimes we're a subtraction church. Sometimes it's declining as people get upset about something or decide they want a different flavor and they go somewhere else. But we would long to be a multiplication church. And you know what it takes to be a multiplication church? It takes individuals beginning to say, it's my job to listen to the promptings of the Spirit and be involved in the community in such a way that I'm ready to share my faith. I'm ready to invite people to coffee and have a discussion. I'm, I'm ready to invite them to church. I'm ready to actively build the kingdom of God. And we, as your leaders and pastors and teachers, are here to equip you and get you Bibles and get you encouragement and help challenge you and answer questions. And I think that there's a lot of things that keep people back. I think sometimes you're standing on the edge of that diving board and you're thinking, oh, I don't know enough. Well, let me encourage you. I don't know is a good answer. If you get into a discussion and you have a question that you don't know what to say, it's a wonderful thing to say, let me get back to you next week. There was a guy that came with his wife to church and he wasn't very attentive, didn't listen much, didn't take notes. I thought, you know, he wasn't really very much into it. And he came to me after church one day and he said, Pastor, I need to learn the Bible. It's like, well, I'm in favor. Uh, but something happened between last week and this week. Something, you know, tied a knot in your tail. And I said, what happened? He said, well, there was these people that came to the door. And they were telling me all kinds of stuff that I don't think is true, but I don't know the Bible. You see, what's interesting is the answers are not near so important to you until you get the questions. And the questions come often as you're trying to share. So I'm going to ask you, whose responsibility it is it to win the lost and to disciple the saved? Whoa, that was quiet. <laughs> whose responsibility is it to win the lost and disciple the saved? Okay, I want you to make it personal. I'm going to ask you once more, and I want you to say, mine. I know, this is a multiple choice question, and I'm giving you one choice. <laughs> Whose job is it to lead people to Christ and disciple them after that? Mine. Yeah. And if that's true, that's scary, isn't it? Yeah. And every time you say yes... God will give you the power and the wisdom and the strength. He goes with us. He goes ahead of us. It's the life of Christ that comes out of us. You're never going to argue anybody into the kingdom. Not only are you not that smart, but it's not how it works. God changes people. But he uses us. Let me tell you how this works in Philip's life. So he follows God's prompting. He steps up. He waits tables. The next scene, there's a persecution that breaks out. 
<laughs> God spreads the church by persecution. I'm not sure we want that method, but maybe if he doesn't use something else, that's what's going to happen. So they all get scattered all over the place, and it says, wherever they went, they were like sparks from a fire starting a new fire. So Philip went up to Samaria, and God's using him, and he's teaching and preaching, and people are getting saved, and it's this exciting moment. And you'd think, wow, that's going to be his story for the next 26 years. Because he's obeying, and God's using him. Look what happens next. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. That's all the directions he gets. God says, I want you to leave what you're doing. In fact, he's leaving a great place. God is working in people's lives. Remember the, the story of Jesus beginning that ministry in Samaria by talking to the woman at the well? And now Philip is expanding on that. The apostles go down, and it's clearly a work of God. He is right where he's supposed to be. And God says, I want you to leave there and go down to the desert road, the one that leads to Gaza. Hmm. That'd be like the Spirit prompting you, saying, I want you to go out to, like, Redmond Bend area. Uh, okay. What am I supposed to do there? Who am I going to see? And it was like, don't you wish God would tell you more sometimes when he uh, invites you into something? Actually, probably the truth is we don't want to know more because we would be like that kid on the diving board going, nope, I'm going back. So God takes him down there in the middle of the desert, and he has a plan for him, but Philip doesn't know what the plan is. So he was in Jerusalem. They get chased out by persecution up to Samaria. And God says, now I want you to go down here to this desert road, the one that leads down to Gaza. And I have a plan for you. Now, the things that God calls us to prepare us for the next thing God wants us to do. Did you get that? The things that God calls us to do prepare us for the next thing God calls you to. When I think about what God did here at Family Church, I am so humbled and amazed. I, re I remember and been telling recently the story of when we came in 1986, and, and there was a little group of 35 people, and as, the more I know about that group, the more I realize how different they were from each other, how there wasn't any sense of real purpose and common unity. They loved God and they loved each other, but we didn't know where we were going. And in my great wisdom as a 29-year-old, I had no clue what I was doing either. I know that may be hard to believe, but I look back and I think of all the churches in Sutherland that God could have picked to say, I want to do something there. It probably wouldn't have been family church. But God chose us. He sent us out, and every time we obeyed him, he took us to a next step, and he developed us, and he matured us, and he, he caused us to have faith and to begin to believe that, that he could do greater things in this tiny little town, and, and now we're impacting places all over the world. Why? Because God loves to do stuff like that. And so God has a plan, and his plan is for Philip to have a highly strategic meeting. It's what's called a divine appointment. And it's probably, if you understand the logistics of this, a once-in-a-lifetime chance. He has to leave something he can see to go to something he can't see. That takes faith. And so he steps out, and the next part of the story says he started out. God told him to go. He said, okay. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means the king of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. This is the first biblical case of a hitchhiker that we have. <laughs> he goes out in the middle of the desert. He sees this Ethiopian. Now, Ethiopia is not where it is today. Ethiopia was called Cush or Nubia but it's approximately 1,500 miles from Jerusalem. And there was a Jewish community down there. And this man had become a believer in the one true God. And so, because he had the wealth, because of his position, he traveled all the way up the Nile, all the way through Egypt, all the way over to Jerusalem. And he went, I think, for the Passover. He was up there making a pilgrimage to the temple, to where his God lived, to where he was coming to worship, and it was the, the peak moment of his life. And evidently he stayed through Pentecost, and I'm sure 
He heard the rumors about a Messiah and the rumors about a resurrection and all those things while he was in town. But now he's going back home. He's headed out. And God sends Philip to intersect him because God has a work not only for one guy in the middle of the desert, but for a whole nation that is going to be impacted by this Ethiopian official. And so God says to Philip, go up and stay near the chariot. If you read on here in chapter 8, it says that the Ethiopian was reading the prophet Isaiah. And he's reading about Jesus and the sacrifice that has just happened in Jerusalem. And I was thinking, this guy must be a serious student. Can you imagine trying to read a scroll in a chariot? I mean, this is before Kendall, remember? <laughs> I mean, seriously, chariot sick, you know? You're trying to read, go along here. And he is seeking God. He's reading Isaiah. He's going through. And Philip goes up to him, and he asks him a great question. He says, so, do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> remember we talked about those good questions that you can start conversations with? Now, this wasn't too hard. God told him to go out in the middle of the desert. God told him to join himself to this chariot. And the guy's reading Isaiah. You think this would be an opening? Yeah. This is kind of downhill with the wind. This is easy. And so he says to him, what is it that you're reading? And he says, how can I understand it? I don't know if Isaiah is talking about himself or somebody else. And I love this verse. It says, and Philip ran up to the chariot and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? You see, there were, there were things he knew about the word. He already loved God, but there were some parts he didn't know. And what did he need? He needed the Spirit prompting Philip so Philip could be prompting him. And he said, how can I understand it unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Now, I don't know if you find humor in the Bible, but it's there. And I was thinking as I read this story, wait a minute now, an angel goes to Philip in Samaria so he can go down and talk to this Ethiopian who's on his way down to, clear down to Nubia. Wouldn't it have been more efficient if the angel had just gone to the Ethiopian? He could have explained the scriptures probably pretty well. It would have been a little more impressive than just some hitchhiker on the side of the road. But he didn't. Why? I think this is incredibly important. Because God wanted Philip to be part of the adventure. Could God do it without you? How much more impressive is an angel than you? Way off the scale, right? But God doesn't send angels very often. He sends us. Why? Because we get to be involved in the adventure. We get to see God at work. And you know, we would love to have those great stories, but we rarely want the circumstances where those stories are created. We don't want to leave something known and head out in the middle of the desert to where we don't know what's going to happen. We don't want to go and start a conversation with a stranger, even if he's reading Isaiah. But if you say yes to God prompting you and to you prompting somebody else, then you have this great adventure that God calls you to. God lets us be part of his prompting. He uses other people to prompt us. He uses us to prompt other people. And all of it, the Spirit of God is working all in the background and he's making eternal things happen. Is it exciting to be a part of the adventure with God? Yeah, it is. It's a wonderful process. And it also develops Philip. Now, the cool part about this story is that we have records from church tradition that there is a church that started in Ethiopia way back in the first century. And that in the 300s, they made Christianity the official religion of Nubia. Where did that start? started right here. One guy being obedient out in the middle of the desert to do something that didn't seem to make any sense and I'm sure was a little scary. And God uses us in a way all along the journey. Now, 
We talk often about this process of following a spiritual pathway. And that it's a little different for each of us, but the main categories are the same. And that there are people who are seekers. And sometimes they are right on the edge. The Ethiopian eunuch was right here. There are some people that are (laughs) are way over here, right? You think they're not interested in God, they're not interested in anything. But you know what? Everybody has a thirst, and God is the only living water there is. And we get to be involved in inviting people into relationship. I will tell you that the best invitation may not be an invitation to church. It may be an invitation to coffee. It may be an invitation to a barbecue. It may be an invitation to to a relationship, to get to know them, to let them get to know you, to let them see Jesus working in you because that's what makes the whole truth about Jesus exciting is they see it at work. They see God working. And then we come to the place where we are students and there's all kinds of help needed in encouraging that understanding of the Bible. I I think his question is very valid. How do I understand it unless somebody explains it to me? There's a critically important process, not only of the Spirit giving you insight, but other people helping teach you and encourage you. And so you move to that place, and I told you it's easy for students to get stuck, and they think it's all about me. And if you have that idea that that church should sing the music you want and your parking spot should be sacred and people should not sit in your chair and it should be comfortable for you and that pastor should quit asking you to do greeting and hugging people and whatever. (laughs) And you want the teaching to be in your place of maturity and you want it to be something you can understand and a student is still, it's all about who? Me. Me. And then God begins to work in your heart and realize that Christ in you wants to help others. And so you begin to say, it's time for me to pay forward. It's time for me to serve others. It's time for me to get involved. And and we challenged you last week to step up and serve somewhere. And even if it's not the perfect place you start with, it, it helps you learn where that perfect place is. And you start doing things for other people. And it starts with just a job, and then it becomes a calling, and you realize God's called us to serve, and sometimes it's in the church, and sometimes it's outside of the church, and God uses that to further develop you. And hopefully you come to the place where, and usually this is involving a crisis, involves some kind of pain, (laughs) and God brings you to the place where really our hope is in Christ alone, that He's the most important Everything else is secondary. And I'd say that this is about not only being close to Christ, but being Christ-centered. And when you're Christ-centered, then you go back through the whole process, and the servants can go back, and the students can go back, and they can be able to be sharing with seekers and helping challenge students and helping equip servants and fellowshipping and encouraging each other. That's what it means to sharpen. It means listening to the Spirit prompting me, continuing to grow and not let myself get stuck on that pathway. And it means God using me to prompt somebody else, to ask good questions, to challenge them. And I I like the fact that Philip didn't know what he was doing at all to start with, and he trusted the Spirit. On the other hand, when it came down to talking about Isaiah, he was already prepared. In other words, he didn't just say, I don't need to study, I don't need to learn, I'm just going to let God put words in my mouth. He said, I need to do my job to prepare and study and be ready to help. On the other hand, there's some stuff I will never know, and the Spirit will just have to cover my my weaknesses. Aren't you glad God can cover your weaknesses? And then there's the next stage in the journey where he has this wonderful moment of baptizing a new believer. He has shared with this guy about the good news about Jesus, the Ethiopian has said, I want to follow Jesus. He's been prepared. He's ready. And then it says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. Uh, We're in Oregon. That may not make a big deal. This is a desert country. Okay? There's not water everywhere. So here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Isn't that a great heart? I think he's asking legitimately, Philip, is it okay if I get baptized? And I want to just lean in for a moment. 
Some of you have not really been baptized. And if you read through the New Testament, it is the most important first step of obedience of everybody who finds Christ. And I loved what the people said at the baptism. I used to be a believer, now I'm a follower. You know what the difference is? Followers obey. It's not something you have in your head. It's a lifestyle of letting Christ work in you and through you. And now I want to follow him. Well, when we follow him, it means we follow him in the next step he's directing us. And I think it's a great question. What stands in the way of you getting baptized? I think sometimes you're thinking, well, I still have some sin issues. I still don't know enough. I still am not mature enough. This guy wasn't even half a chariot ride mature. He just heard about what Isaiah was talking about. He just heard about the good news about Jesus. He just gave his life to Christ. Baptism isn't the end of the journey. It's the beginning. All it means is you're sincere. What else holds us back? Well, I got baptized as a baby, and my parents would be offended if I got baptized again. Well, I answer this question often. You don't ever need to be re-baptized. You need to be really baptized which means that after you have trusted Christ and surrendered your life to Him, then you can get baptized, and only then. Before that, it's just a bath. And so when you wrestle through that and you start saying, oh, and I'll tell you, if your parents really love God, if you say to them, thanks for helping me get started, but I need to do this now that I'm following Jesus for myself. If they love God, they will say, go. If they just love their own tradition, they will be resistant, but you can't let that stop you. I think sometimes it's fear. We're standing on the edge and we're thinking, oh man, I look terrible with wet hair. I hate talking in front of crowds. I don't know what I would say. I'll be embarrassed. You know, somebody who had struggled with whether or not to get baptized finally said, I'm ready. And I said, what changed your mind? And she said, we were singing this song and I realized if Jesus went to the cross for me, could I not at least get wet for him? It's hard to argue with that logic, isn't it? And he said, what's to stand in the way of me getting baptized? And last time we had the service in the park, we had a number of individuals that stepped up and they declared their faith in Christ in front of a whole crowd to say, I'm not perfect, I haven't arrived, but I'm sincere. And many of them had family out there, some of whom are not believers. And they're declaring in front of the watching world, I'm a follower of Jesus. He lives in me. He's changing me. He's working in me. And I'm on his team. And you know, this is a picture of Austin getting baptized. And here's Pastor Will, who was a key part of his journey. And and here's his mom over here. And we have, for the last several years, encouraged people who were a vital part of your spiritual development to help in the baptism. And I am deeply trying to create an envy in you that you would be up there soon helping baptize someone that you had the privilege of being a part of their spiritual journey. You got to share Christ with them. You invited them to church. You were a, a part of teaching them their beginning steps. And you got to be part of that. And when it comes time for baptism, they say, would you be part of my baptism? And you ought to be walking on cloud nine. Because these are the important things. These are the things that last. Your retirement's not that important, your, your 401k, your job, all the things that we stress out about. Nobody cares if you mowed your lawn, nobody cares if your car is that clean. But the things that last forever are people. And God treasures people. And I believe that God is saying to us, I want you to jump. I want you to step in. I want you to obey. And last week I asked you to try to ask some important questions to somebody. And here's the test. I told you, was it going to be on the test? Yes. How many of you made an effort to ask at least an interesting question this last week? All right. For 4%, we got great marks. And I do that not to embarrass anybody, but I want to challenge you. Do you see how easy it is to hear and never intend to do? And God wants us to hear and intend to do. And God will bring the Ethiopian along at the right time. He just wants you to be ready and prepared. I'm going to have to off to Green and to South Umqua, Pastor Sky and Pastor Will, as you guys walk through these challenges. God bless you. Love you.
Two questions. Where do you need to say yes? For some of you, as I was talking, God began stirring your heart. You know somebody you need to pray for. You know somebody you need to talk to. You know something that you need to do. Some of you need to get baptized. And this is so fun for me. I have no idea what God wants you to do. I can give you the scripture and the general thing, and I am trusting that God will do that work that he can do where he taps on your heart and goes, this is what you need to do. Somebody told me last weekend, they said, I wish you'd quit picking on me. (laughs) Had another guy get really mad at his wife when they walked out. He said, did you call him ahead of time? (laughs) That's when you know God's at work, don't you? Because he takes the general message of the word and he begins to apply it. So my question to you is, where do you need to say yes? Do you need to say, yes, God, this is my job. I want to be a part of following the adventure and sharing with those people that need to come to Jesus. And I'm inadequate and I'm scared, but I'm available. I'm going to say yes. And if you begin to say yes, God will provide the opportunities. If you say, God, if you put a person in my path today, I will speak up. Watch out. All right, because God's more invested in this than you are. Second question is, how are you prompting other people's growth? Not only does the Spirit prompt us, but He wants us to prompt others. And you don't have to know everything. And as we say, you don't have to fill their cup, you just have to pour out what's in yours. And when God teaches you, then you have a chance to teach somebody else. And that's all God asks of you. And as you pour out what you know, then God pours into you. And the cycle continues. And we want to be a church of multiplication. And I believe Douglas County is different because family church is here already. But this is nothing like what could happen if he used every one of us to lead somebody to Christ in this coming year. That would be a holy mess. But it would be a glorious mess, wouldn't it? Father, thank you for these stories from your word that challenge us in our own life, that cause us to realize, God, how easily we take a back seat and we are very interested in our own comfort and very fearful of what people think. And God, I thank you for these believers here who are involved in the schools, who are involved in the marketplace, who are involved in the neighborhoods, who are involved in coaching kids' teams, who are involved in all kinds of networks within our community. I pray that you would give us courage and strength and the words to say and that, God, we would begin seeing you pour out your spirit in us and through us to others. And we ask, God, for that kind of revival that says we are excited about what you're doing. We are available for your serving. Whatever you call us to do, we've already said yes. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.